Friends, it is a joy, and this is one of the most exciting things to me, I think, as, as, as a pastor, pastoring a church, is, is seeing people grasp the vision and saying, yeah, I see what God's doing through these people. I'm seeing what, the work that God is doing, and I want to be a part of that. And that's what the Hutzels, that's what the persons have, have joined with, and, that, and that's your heart's desire for many of you as well, is to say, yes, we're excited about following Jesus. We're excited about following Jesus together as a community. And so we're in week number three of this series that we've entitled Community, with emphasis on the unity. How are we as redeemed people of Jesus Christ in a chaotic world who doesn't, can't agree whether masks or no masks, who can't agree between candidates, who can't even agree whether it's Pepsi or Coke, McDonald's or Burger King, the big things and the little things, how are we as redeemed people of Christ called to live? We saw two weeks ago that, that it is because God pursued us. God invites us first and foremost into community with him, into communion that transforms our lives. It's not that we've somehow figured it out. It's not that we somehow earned God's love, God's affection. No, it's because of the deepness of God's mercy, because of the, the wideness, the, the, the vastness of his grace that welcomes us in, that calls us into community first with him through the blood and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through the, through the very physical death of Jesus Christ that paid the penalty for our sins and the resurrection that, that reminds us that this kingdom that we are proclaiming, this kingdom that we are joined together is an unrestrainable kingdom. We saw that in the last series, that, that this kingdom that we pray that would come and, and have its dominion on this earth and that we are joined into is an unrestrainable movement of God, that there is nothing that will stand against the victory of God. We saw last week the beautiful portrait of, of what community is called to be. And if you missed last week because we weren't physically on site, I want to encourage you to, to spend some time this week, pull that message up, and listen to as, as Tamara shared about what that truly means to be a community, what that means to be united on mission together. And this week we, we turn to the reality that we live in a very politically chaotic world. And ideally, this would have came next week, but I felt like this week's series fit well for the time, for the week that this was. And if I do this well this morning, you'll hear the heart of God proclaimed through his scripture, and you won't care who voted for who and, and, and what the outcome was, because, friends, we're going to see this morning that, that though we live in a world that votes for presidents and governors and mayors, though we are subject to those in political power around us, we stand as a community under the power of God himself. So friends, this morning we are going to start in Romans chapter 11. So if you've got a Bible with you, I want to encourage you to, to open it. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's one in the seat you're on or in front of you or behind you. And granted, if you've got six feet of space, chances are there's about four Bibles within reach. And we just encourage you to open to Romans chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, if you're online and, and wherever you are doesn't have a Bible nearby, we just the words will come up on the screen as we go along. But we want to be people who are in the Word together, who are reading the Word together, or allowing God to speak in and through that. When Paul writes to the Romans, he has not yet ventured out there, but he is writing to a church that he has heard about. He's writing to believers who are as distant as Republicans and Democrats could be. Because Paul's context, the, the, the followers of Christ are Jews who follow Christ, and Gentiles who follow Christ. They are dynamically set apart by race and by region, but they are united because Jesus Christ they recognize as the source of all hope. This Jesus who lived on the earth, who taught, was not just a good teacher, but he gave his very life so that they could be redeemed into a relationship with God himself. We have those who were raised up as God's people and understood that Jesus was the Messiah. And then you have the Gentiles who otherwise were separated, otherwise were kept out, but they have embraced this truth. And Rome is a very volatile time that, that Paul is writing this. This is, if you know your history, Nero, in a decade later, will kick out all the Jews. He will just, just expel them from the city. And this is, will not be the first time that this happens. In fact, they've already been expelled before Paul writes this. So you have this understanding that, that things are a little difficult, that, that when Paul is writing to these believers who are united in this mission, who are united in this vision to see Jesus Christ's name glorified. 
they still come with a lot of division and a lot of baggage. And right at the end of chapter 11, in verse 33, Paul writes about this. He spent the first 11 chapters of this letter casting forth the mercy of God. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of, and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. And then he gives a kickback to Isaiah 55 and he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Paul spent these first 11 chapters calling these believers, calling these who, who otherwise are divided but are united by this one central thing, he calls them to recognize that God's ways are higher, that God's mercy is greater, that they did not somehow earn it, but, but they are united because God has extended himself to them, that he is the source, he is the means, and he is the good of all things. He is the goal of all things, that, that in all things come from him, are found in him, and lead to him. He is the, the single purpose that, that unites them. That though there are many things that, that can divide them, they are joined together in this one mission and vision. And, and the truth is that in all these things, God receives the glory. And for friends, for you and I who are joined together in this mission, who, who are united in this, of saying, you know what, there's so many things that could divide us, but we are united in this one thing, that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are called into a relationship with God himself, that that is the one thing, if nothing else, that is the one thing that unites us and that this church is built upon. We understand that in all things, God deserves the glory. In all things, it is God who is merciful and God deserves the glory for what he has done. His opening to, of us into communion with him is incredibly gracious and beautiful. This is the cause for living. This is the cause of joy and jubilation. We see that God is the architect of the great plan of, in history of salvation. And this is what Paul has been writing about in these past 11 chapters. Friends, as we look around us in the, the landscape of the United States and the world around us right now, we see division. We see chaos. We see hurt that comes from that division and that chaos. And Paul is writing to these Jews and to these Gentiles, one that came with privilege and the other that did too, but it was a very different privilege. Paul is writing with the, the desire and the hopes to unite them. Friends, does unity matter? Does it matter that, that we have unity together? Absolutely. But it's that we must understand that we are united by the common cause of Christ's name being made known. There's no other thing that unites us. And, and, if, and if we fail to grasp that it is the name of Jesus Christ that unites us, if, if we centralize on something else about, about everyone being at least six foot tall or everyone being comfortable with certain songs, or if we, if we wrap our, 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 un, our unity around something else other than the name of Jesus Christ, friends, we will quickly find a vision and we will quickly find ourselves drifting away from who God has called us to be. But as Community Covenant Church, we have placed as the central focus that we want to be about loving God, loving others, and making disciples. We want to be about proclaiming this truth and being united that it is Jesus Christ's name that we want to see glorified. The stakes, my friends, are too high to simply allow division to continue. See, Paul goes on to continue. Very next verse, he says, because of this, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, because all of this, because of the mercy, because of the grace, because of the great love with which God has loved you, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Because of God's mercy and grace, we are called to surrender our whole selves. Do you see what word Paul says? He says, I appeal to you. He doesn't say, I just suggest. He says, I appeal to you. I urge you. I, I, I can't make this any more loud and more clear that, that this is what you need to do. Because God has been so merciful, friends, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your whole self as this living sacrifice that is submitted to God to bring him glory. 
He says the temptation is to be conformed to the world, to fit the world's standards. But, but, but we as followers of Christ, we who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, who've, who've entered into this relationship with God himself, are called to be transformed. We're called to be transformed. But rather than focusing on what divides us, Paul implores us to be united, to acknowledge what it is that unites us. That it is God who is acceptable, who is perfect, that, who is good, that is the one who unites us. Namely, he says here, we are each recipients of God's grace. This is what unites us. It is no other thing, but it is God's grace and our reception of that. It's why we can, we can stand here with the persons in the hutzels and say, you came from Kansas, you came from over here, and, and, and we're united in this because it's not about heritage. It's not about anything else except for the fact that God has redeemed you and God is in the process of transforming you. And we say, yes, we want to be on mission with you. We receive you into this. Because it would be very easy to be exclusive and say, oh, sorry, you weren't here before 2013, therefore you don't get to be in. It would be very easy to, to put exclusions around that, but as a church we say, no, we're going to be united by this. That all who say they are redeemed by Jesus Christ, all who have entered into this relationship with God, all who are recipients of God's grace, we're on mission with. Rather than seeing their history, Paul says, be united by God's grace. It had been very easy for them to see their history, both, both the long history and say, oh, well, Jews, you're, you're more favored because you're God's people. Gentiles, you don't stand a chance. Again, he's writing to the people in Rome. So it'd be very easy for the Romans to, on the flip side, say, oh, but we are citizens of Rome. The Jews are second class. It'd be very easy for them to, to cling to their history and allow that to divide them. It'd be very easy for them to cling to things like gender, class, race. But instead, they're united by the fact that they were dead in their sin, but yet they have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. Friends, regardless of who you are, regardless of your gender, regardless of your race, regardless of your name, your heritage, you will stand to account before God. And there's only one response within the Christian community. We are those who acknowledge the death and the resurrection of Christ. We experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we look forward to God's kingdom, this unrestrainable kingdom coming in fullness. Friends, you and I, we can sit around and remember our past. And we can allow that to divide us, or we can move forward in unity. We are called to surrender ourselves completely, to be transformed, to fit into the mold that God has created us for and who he has created us to be. So all this, all this, to set the context for where we're really going this morning. It's then that Paul moves into these drastic and radical commands just a few verses later. Because you are surrendering yourselves, because you are being transformed, he picks up in verse 9, he says, because of the transformation that's happening in you, because God extended himself when you were junk and you were in your sin and you, were, you had nothing to bring to the table, God didn't say, oh, I, I see that. He says, I'm going to go ahead and step into this and redeem you. He says, because that's your story, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And all of us are like, whoa, Paul, you know, we, we were just, you know, we, we thought it was rough of being like, hey, live in the same neighborhood as somebody else. This is a little bit too much. Are, are you sure about this, Paul? Are, are you sure this is really the command that we're called to live? I mean, I know that God, you know, extended himself completely to us and, and invites us into a relationship, but, but come on. This is a little bit too drastic. Friends, if that's you, hold on to your seats. Because verse 14, he says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. See, friends, something happens to us in the transformation that God is doing in us. See, a community transformed in the likeness of Christ appears vibrantly different than anything else. 
We're not called to look like everybody else. We're not called to, that our lifestyle would, would look just like our neighbor who has not received the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, who has not acknowledged that they are in a relationship with God. Friends, the transforming work that Jesus Christ is doing in us should cause us to appear vibrantly different than anything else. Vibrantly more beautiful, vibrantly, vibrantly more colorful, vibrantly more attractive because we know hope, because we've experienced mercy, because we've experienced grace, because we are being transformed. Friends, the Bible is the product of displaced exile people and a document for exiles, people who have a complex relationship with their actual home as they long for a greater home that is not possible in the current world around them. The story of the Bible is about people who had to cultivate a unique identity as God's people while integrating into the dominant cultures that were totally contrary to the kingdom of God. Friends, if you are very comfortable in the world around you, this might be a sign that God's transforming work has been put to a halt by you in your own life. Because there should be an unrest within us of saying, I don't feel at home here. It's like I was created for something else because, friends, you were. When you stepped into this relationship with God, when, when God began to transform you, he began to reorient your heart to a heavenly home. But yet we're stuck in this world around us. We're stuck to be transformed in the midst of the chaos and the COVID and the darkness and the pain and the evil and the heartbreak around us. And that's why Paul goes into these verses and says, bless those who persecute you. Live contrary to the world around you. We saw in, in, in the Lord's Prayer series that we just finished up, we saw how this is a backwards, upside down kingdom. That everything that we know is, is disoriented because we have lived into the selfishness for so long. That, that this is the right way to live. But it seems so contrary to how we see it expressed around us. Why do we do this? Why, do, why does Paul say that God has called us to live such drastically different lives? Because our deepest desire, rather than revenge, rather than getting what we want, is getting what God wants. What does God want? God wants his glory to be made known. God wants repentance from all people. That, that, that they would reflect the glory of God. We are called to live like Christ, to live differently, because in that, we are putting on display that the transformation that comes from being redeemed, restored, and renewed is greater than the momentary earthly reality that we live in. See, friends, for us, following Jesus leads us to embrace selfless living, just like Jesus. Following Jesus leads us to embrace selfless living just like Jesus. Paul didn't stop it as much as it belongs, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. He actually continued in verse 19 and says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Friends, this is drastically different. We as a community are called to live drastically different lives than the world around us because we're following Jesus. And that leads us to embrace selfless living just as Jesus did. You know, we could close it up, call it a day, and end, at the, and end here in chapter 12. But Paul's not quite done writing. So he goes into chapter 13, which is relevant for us, not because we live in Rome, because we don't, not because half of us are Jews and half of us are Gentiles, because last time I checked, probably most of us have a Gentile heritage. We can't claim that we have a heritage, an earthly heritage that aligns with the Israelites. Friends, we find a source that we can pursue in this because of the world that we live in. And he begins to talk about how we're called to live in relationship to the civil authorities around us. 
And so while there's some things to be said about Paul is writing to a direct audience in Rome at the time, there's also truth that we can take away from this, of how we as a community, of people who acknowledge that we have a home that is not here, that we were created for something more, that we were called to live in relationship with others that is transforming because of the transforming work that we have had done in us because of Jesus Christ. Paul enters into these words in chapter 13. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you are wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in, subject, in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Friends, I would be lying to you if I said that I didn't have to wrestle with this this week. Because regardless of which bubble you filled in on the ballot, there, there's a sense of, okay, God, but wait. But that happens when we read this. Because if we had to choose between two people, or regardless of the race, regardless of the politics, regardless of it, if we knew that we had, if we had to choose between Jesus and Jesus 2.0, we'd be like, yeah, I'll fully affirm this. But we say, you know what? I can see flaws in their character. I can see flaws in their policy. God, I, I don't know how I can do this. I, I don't know what you want me to do with what Paul is saying here in Romans 13. How am I called to live in subject to this person? Maybe for the past four years you've said, I don't know how I can live in subjugation to this person. Maybe after the ballots have been counted so far, you're saying, I don't know how I can live in subjection to the future president. Friends, chances are you're in one of those two camps. And so the question is, what do we do with this? Why does Paul point us to this? And friends, if I can very simply say, because there is a greater home to which we are called. Because there is a greater king to which we are called to serve. Because there is a greater hope. There is a greater work that is being done. If if we step out of our our, our four-year box here, and we look at the span of history, and we see all the rulers who were not acknowledging God as God, that God used to bring glory that God used to orchestrate his world, that God used to orchestrate the redemption and the hope. And we say, okay, I can stand in line with that. Because the rulers of Rome at the time that Paul is writing this were not God-honoring people. We're not people who said, oh, Christians, we're going to fully affirm this. Oh, Christians, you just do whatever you want to. Their policy was flawed. Their character was flawed. But yet Paul says there is something greater that is happening here. There is a kingdom to which you belong that far exceeds this. Now, I don't think for one second Paul is saying roll over and play dead. I think Paul is calling us to, as his first word, be subject. Notice Paul doesn't say in this first verse of Romans 13, he says, let every person obey the governing authorities. Notice that would have been a totally different word. Because sometimes the governing authorities call us to things that are contrary to God's word. That call us contrary to God's kingdom. That call us contrary to God's standards. That call us contrary to what the Holy Spirit is teaching us and the work that God is transforming us in. So, you know, Paul doesn't say let every person obey, but he says let them be subject. He says submit yourselves. You submitted yourselves in Romans 12 that God would transform you. You submitted yourselves to the work that God is doing. Now, if you acknowledge that God is the one that you're subject to, can't you trust him to lead you? That you can abide in unity with those that you disagree with politically. That you can actually attend the same church as people who who may be the far other end of the color spectrum as you. Friends, I intentionally wore a purple shirt today. 
because I have a lot of blue checks and a lot of red checks, but I didn't want to cast any side. I decided to let's, let purple is about what I can go. Because the, the kingdom that God calls us into is a purple kingdom. It's not a red or blue kingdom. It's not, it's not divided. It's a kingdom that's united for the glory of God, for the glory of the king. Because as Revelation 17 so Revelation 17 tells us that the enemies are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Friends, that's you in the last line. If you're entered into a relationship with God, you are called and chosen and faithful, and the King is victorious. This is an unrestrainable kingdom. Jesus is is king of kings and lord of lords. Ephesians, Paul writes this in chapter 1 of Ephesians. He says, the immeasurable greatness of his, of God's power through Jesus Christ toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Friends, we stand submitted to God who, because of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, has transformed our lives. We submit ourselves. We surrender to him and we say, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to trans be transformed by you. And because this kingdom is not my primary kingdom, because I was created for something else, I can live at peace with those around me who may disagree with me, who may, who may see things from a different side who may seek my pain. Because again, Paul writes this, and I think that God is big enough that if God thought that what Nero was going to do less than a decade later to the Roman Jews was going to invalidate this, that he would have stopped Paul from writing it. Because less than a decade later, Nero sieges upon the Jews. Like, makes war on them. And so I don't think that these calls to be subject to them invalidates God's work that he's doing. In fact, I think that even more so calls us to depend upon God. Because it's easy to depend upon ourselves. It's easy to depend upon what choice I make. It's easy to depend upon human people. But God says, really, depend on me. Place your trust in me. Because, friends, Jesus is king. We submit to the authority around us because God's kingdom is greater than we can even imagine. And the king who we truly serve is greater than we can imagine. We're called to submit to authority because there's something bigger going on than electing mayors, senators, and presidents. God is at work. God's plan A is not government officials to save the day. God's plan A is for his people, his redeemed, made righteous through Christ, humble and obedient people to carry forth the ministry of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God. Friends, that is God's plan A. God only has one plan. I don't care this morning if your choice of candidate is in the White House or will be in the White House or didn't even make it on the ballot. God's ideal candidate is seated, guess where? in your seat. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be the next president, but God's candidate for his transforming work is seated in your seat. No, you didn't sit in the wrong seat. I'm saying it's you. You are the one whom he has prepared, is preparing, and will faithfully work through to impact the lives of your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, your children, your spouse. Friends, my conflicted story with politics is that in 2006, as a crazy college freshman, I decided, hey, this would be a good idea for me to run for the Kansas House of Representatives. And so I filed the paperwork. I went door to door. I campaigned. Thankfully, I lost. <laughs> but what I realized as I met with people, as I tried to get people to, to think, hey, vote for me. Be a smarty. Vote for Marty. <clears throat> I didn't use that one. That was like middle school. But... is that the world around us is looking for government, is looking for civil authorities, is looking for policy that will help them. 
the number of people that I would interact with who, who wanted this certain policy enacted, and then the very next person I met with would want the total opposite, who would expect one thing from government and, and another person who said, government, get out of my life. And I realized what everyone is searching for is truly in the church. Where the church has faltered is where the world is looking for the government to step in. And I said, this is crazy. And it was that God began to work in me to, to surrender to him what he was truly calling me to do, which was to do work in the local church. Of saying, this is my plan A. Because the number of conversations that I can recount to you of thinking like, yeah, that's not a human policy. There's so much red tape in there. There's so many conflicted things. If that happened, then this would happen and that would be bad. When what was truly going on was they were looking for the church to step up and step in. Friends, that's why we can look at Romans 13 and say, it really doesn't matter who's in the White House because God is still victorious because Jesus is still king and the call to his church is still to step in and step out, to step into the mess around us, to step into the lives of the people around us, to step out of our own homes and into the lives of those that God has called us to be in ministry to and with. Jesus is still on the throne Jesus is still king. This is not just a pithy statement. This is a proclamation that we get to join with and say, Jesus is still on the king. Jesus is still the king. He's still on the throne. Friends, the hope that that provides for us, the reminder that he is victorious, has been, is, and will be. So friends, regardless of how you feel after this week, Regardless of whether there's joy welling in you or sorrow, whether you carry the pain of a country divided, friends, we are the kingdom that is not divided. We are the kingdom that gets to step into a kingdom that is divided and proclaim there is hope, there is a future, there is promise. There is a God who loves you and who has already sought to redeem you and restore you and calls you to simply step into a relationship with him. Friends, would you pray with me this morning?